My name is Noah Horowitz. I'm director emeritus for Art Basel, um, and I oversee the show here in Miami Beach. Um, we did our press conference here yesterday, which I think this is possibly even more attended than the press conference. I think there's two amazing things about opening our show yesterday when we see all the amazing people come in. Um, it's incredible. I think equally incredible is seeing an entirely packed room at 10 a.m. the following day. Um, uh, thank you so much for coming here. This is going to be an amazing conversation. Um, for those of you that, that perhaps were not going to show this here, just a few highlights. There's 269 galleries um, at Art Basel Miami Beach 2016, um, 21 new galleries. Um, you should really make your way into the halls after this if you can. Um, the show is, of course, on until Sunday. Um, this is our 15th edition this year, um, so we're celebrating 15 years in Miami Beach since we first arrived in 2002. Um, it's a great fair. Um, we think it's better than ever, and, and I do hope that you'll make your way inside. Um, the conversations and salon program for us is an absolutely integral part to everything we do above and beyond um, the amazing presentations that you'll see in the booth. Um, this makes that real. Um, this is where we see our come to life and where we bring together um, artists, curators, scholars, critics, commentators, market practitioners, etc., um, to engage with one another. Um, it's an incredibly fundamental part of everything we produce, and, and we're really enriched and rewarded to see all of you here with us um, this morning. Um, we have 20 conversations in salons. Conversations are a longer format um, that we, we, we reserve for the mornings. Um, there's four of those. This is, of course, the first. Um, the salon program is meant more as an informal conversation, discursive forum um, that happens once the show is open uh, in the afternoons. Um, the program is curated by Mary Spirito. Mary, wherever you are, thank you so much. Mary is an amazing collaborator, um, the founder and director of Proto Cinema in New York and Istanbul. Um, Annalie Graff, I'd like to thank as well. It's her first year working with us to help coordinate this, so big thanks to Annalie. Um, each year we kick off with what we call the keynote conversation, and this year um, we are absolutely delighted and thrilled to have a, uh, a living legend with us today, Julio Le Park, um, born in Argentina, living in France since the late 50s, um, in conversation with Dr. Estrellita Brodsky. Um, she's the curator, as, as I'm sure you're aware, of the, the, uh, the retrospective that's currently on view at the Perez Art Museum here in Miami Beach. Um, it's the first solo show and, and first major comprehensive retrospective of, of, of Le Park in, in North America. So um, everybody that's in this room should make their way to Pam this week uh, or the weeks that follow. Um, to see that, um, he's um, an absolutely influential and, and, and integral artist in, in kinetic and off-art movement, um, a, a, real, a real influence for, for generations upon generations of artists that have come after him. Many young artists look, uh, working today looking at what he's done. Um, so I'm not going to linger up here. I'm going to hand over to the experts, but I want to send um, a thank you to everybody in the audience and, and a really warm um, thank you to Julia Park and Mr. Rita um, for joining us here. This is really amazing. Um, all the conversations, by the way, are, are online after the show, so for those of you that want to see this again, or if there's others that interest you, you should go on our website and make sure to, to, to check those out. But, but a warm thank you and a welcome to Art Basel Miami Beach, and, and I'll hand it over from here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I thought I'd give a brief introduction to Julio, who is fourth. Uh, a la obra de Julio antes de empezar nuestra conversación porque él ha estado trabajando uh, como lo mencionó Noah ha sido poco no muy percibido en Estados Unidos pero los últimos 60 años ha estado trabajando y ha definido sus prácticas artísticas en una constante búsqueda de buscar participación con el público pero siempre buscando lo sólido y lo utópico buscando este tipo de arte como un laboratorio social y lo hace produciendo situaciones impredecibles y provocando en forma juguetona la participación del espectador en nuevas formas. Él ha resaltado el papel del artista como un instigador en lugar de un genio artístico. Su meta es transformar la noción de un espectador pasivo a un participante activo. Y como él mismo lo describió en 1968, su meta era que la idea era despertar la capacidad potencial
potencial que tiene la gente de participar y decidir por sí mismos y guiarlos para que entren en contacto con los demás para desarrollar una acción común. Como lo mencionó Noah, nació en 1928 en Mendoza, Argentina, y asistió a la Escuela de Bellas Artes en Buenos Aires en 1943. Eh, tiene exhibiciones en Buenos Aires que han sido gran catalizador para su salida ese año a una beca en Francia. Ha hecho trabajo colaborador con y con Hachel Davisuel en 1960, que también se llama Horacio García Rossi, Francisco Sobrino, François Morley, Joel Stein y Jean Pierre Ibarra. Although the group dissolved in 1968, international collaborative, particularly those involved in politically denouncing totalitarian regimes. Representing Argentina in 1966 at the Venice Biennale, Park won the grand international prize as an individual artist. His works have been the subject of numerous solo shows in Europe and Latin America, including the Instituto Torcuato de Tela in Buenos Aires, the Museo de Bellas Artes in Caracas, Mexico, Casa de las Américas, in Havana, Moderna Museum in Stockholm, Daros, Zurich, Sao Paulo, and Rio, and um, more recently at the Palais de Tokyo in Paris. Among the group shows in which he's participated have been the landmark 1961 exhibition of Bogenbegen, the MoMA's 1965 response of I, and not so long ago, Dinamo in France, and even in the United States, super sensorial at MoCA and the Hirshhorn, and the Elusive Eye at the Museo del Barrio. Y en el Museo de His work is part of renowned collections all over the world, and this event takes place under the framework of the Park's most recent exhibition, Julio Le Park, Form into Action, which I had the pleasure and honor to curate in Miami and is currently on view. Jamil Le Park, the artist's son, who has been working with El Maestro for the past 10 years, served as artistic advisor and Tobias Ostrander, Pam's chief curator, coordinated the exhibition of Pam with the aid of Jen Inácio. So I want to thank them bien, because they were really an integral part of getting the exhibition together. And of course, it was a very complicated supuesto, exhibition because I think Julio just loves working with curators, especially ones with big egos like myself. Que tienen grandes egos, <laughs> como es mi caso. He let me do exactly what I wanted. It was so easy. Lo que quise fue tan fácil. <laughs> he just let gave us all carte blanche because uh, carta Julio is very blanca. much a living artist Porque and, and feels so strongly that the work has to be appreciated directly by uh, the public. So it was a wonderful collaboration and I must say I feel a little older and wiser from the uh, experience but Julio seems to be getting younger and younger with every time uh, he shows his, his work and, and, and certainly should be very proud of it. So I think over the next um, close to an hour, we thought we could discuss, start with your life in Argentina and then go on to Paris, but, um, and then delve more into the specifics of your, of your work. And, and once again, thank you so much for the organizers of uh, Miami Basel too. So I'd like to begin the conversation, Julio, with uh, a brief overview of your early development in the 19th and 50s in Argentina, a little about when and why you started thinking of yourself as an artist, and what did that mean to you at the time? Well, I think I was born in 1963. The artists who have made uh, this uh, show possible in the same way that other fairs have been happening Porque around no the world. Because if you really do a study, we have to be grateful to the art galleries. With the sales of the artists' uh, artwork, uh, the commissions that they have earned are devoted partly to the creation of other fairs, such as this one, which have a commercial aspect, but at the same time they allow numerous people to be confronted with uh, artwork in real time and in one space. 
which is not always possible. Para responder a la pregunta de And now to answer Estrellita's question, which I can't remember <laughs> which one it was. When you first started thinking of yourself as an individual artist, when you started uh, to uh, become formed as an artist, there are things that have always been there from the time I was young, since I was a teenager, when Lucio Fontana was a professor at the Preparatory School of Fine Arts. And then in the 50s, when uh, there was a movement uh, from the students that uh, created a confrontation between students, professors, associations, and with the will that we had of changing our study plans, we began relating with other young students and young artists, which was very helpful for me. And we analyzed our situation as artists, and that's when a group of us decided to go to Paris to really see what was really going on, which at the time, Paris was the international art center. That was by the end of the 50s. Maybe you can talk a little bit more specifically about what you took away when, when you were still in school in the 40s. Yes, from Lucio Fontana, the ideas that he particularly in instilled in you. Fontana, the ideas that he particularly instilled in you. I was very young. I was a teenager, 16 years old. But you were still, you were young, but you were very joven, well read, and even then. La lectura, un, en ese entonces. Well, the interest that we all had as a curious uh, youth was go to galleries, museums, read books, and of course, Fontana, when he first came as a professor in the preparatory school, more than a professor, he was a great host. Uh, he would stimulate us. He would talk to us, and that was exactly when he proposed us to do the uh, White Manifest, which uh, I did not subscribe to, because I thought there was a big distance between what ha was being proposed. I respected Fontana's ideas, but us as youth, I was 16, and the oldest in the class probably was 20, uh, we didn't really have a practice in confronting these ideas. We also had the Concrete Art and Invention Group, which uh, proposed. Uh, we had some images uh, right now that were being displayed, but uh, the proposal was the relation with the uh, viewer at a very single squared uh, triangle forms with very pure colors, and uh, they would call themselves as the didactic material. So I was in Buenos Aires with them, with Fontana, with the Concrete Art Group, and then the Argentinian artists, uh, who were the equivalent of the uh, Mexican moralistas. And all of them had a very progressive uh, attitude uh, in society. They thought about a better future. They were uh, idealists uh, with perspectives. And for me, those two situations were fundamental, and they were always I fundamental to me. I think you touch on a very me. interesting point point that at the time, there the important uh, movement of the Mexican muralists, but also the concrete art, both those tendencies had a political base in the sense of being 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 a political in the sense of being a political base in the sense of being a impersonal and not that politically grounded, but maybe you can explain a little bit the ideas of dialectical materialism in terms of art. I believe that both those who work with geometric uh, forms and with human form may be very diverse in their points of view, their attitudes, in the um, case of concrete art, they understood the position of the muralists. And at the same time, they claimed that with pure form, 
and simple forms they could create a contact. And muralists, through their forms, were aspiring a social change in society. There could be other uh, figurative artists which would uh, work with dead nature or portraits of people, landscapes, uh, and they were less concerned about the social and, and you've issues. you've also told me about the Usted period when you dropped out of school in, in the, the, the early 50s and you spent time in Rio de la Plata, and that also formed, how did, how did that form your, your ideas about demystifying art or democratizing art, the, the groups that you met with in those days and, and had discussions with? In fact, at Rio de la Plata, it was something informal. I got there. It was a place right on the edge of the river. Usually, we would go there on Saturdays and Sundays just to sunbathe, do uh, Swiss exercise. And um, in a way, we all gathered. We had meetings. And I would listen, just like a sponge. And it was very interesting, because there were all types of people, sailors, who had uh, worked uh, for six months, and uh, would come to sunbathe and to rest. Uh, we also had people with Christian trends, communist uh, union leaders. There were bakers. And then the youth, who we were, and we would improvise meetings that would, would have discussions about all types of topics related to the human being, social situations, uh, the thinking. And through that confrontation, I learned and I found a way to be able to understand. In fact, I never participated as with other uh, young people who would listen and listen. Well, we had some forums where we had confrontations and discussions, and that also was part of my uh, learning. I and was about 16 or 17 the, years um, old. University, uh, uh, excuse me, La Escuela de, de, de Arte, that uh, you, you actually formed a, um, a student uh, group to close down the university and to reform the, the way it was it seems to me it was a very politically volatile time but also a very active intellectual period and and when you went back to school that you you felt that it was important to change the way that art was being taught in the school was a crossroad of political character in 45, when the military um, this took Juan Perón out of office, and they were able to open possibilities in universities. But uh, still, we cannot forget that those who um, outthroned uh, Perón were militaries. They called it soft dictatorship, but it was still a coup. It was a coup d'etat, uh, and in the fine art school, uh, we stressed that it was not a university. We were proposing reforms, changing plans, changing professors, trying to find better spaces for the students, for the work, and uh, we closed uh, the schools. We threw out the directors, and the professors were all available. We called painters from Buenos Aires who came to give free painting classes. We had exhibitions of contemporary art in schools. We had a lot of assemblies and, and, you also and meetings. talked about the printmaking process, that you would get together and make prints, and, and, uh, and it became a very formative period because you went through all these different phases, no? <coughs> the printing process was mostly during the summer when we had the, uh, in Fine Arts, uh, School of Arts for printing, Sobrino Mayando, Garcia Roses, and Marco uh, 
art, uh, we did a curation art. It's a system that we created, it was a very elemental system, monocopy, which allowed uh, it was never different from printing. It allowed us in 15, 20 days to have a print and go through the different phases. The monoscopy issue would allow us in one day to create four or five different variants and we could see immediate results. In that way, the influential that we had as young people admired by Picasso, uh, the abstract artists, et cetera, et cetera, could be uh, eliminated. And then in summer, we could create 100 or 120 monocopies, which, al which allowed us to be influential that we and were able to be followed for many how years. Was it different from from what you had seen before in 1958 at the exhibition in Buenos Aires? The Vasaret work was, uh, had a very big impact in the city of Buenos Aires. It was geometric concrete art, and throughout the years it had divided, and it, was, it had become very academic. Vasari's work, uh, above all his white paintings and black paintings, uh, opened windows and possibilities for development for us, and uh, along with what we had studied from Monteriam, it was a a, a very solid foundation for us to branch out on our own with our and own then, experiences. And then in 1958, in the French scholarship to go to Paris. And what was your experience when you arrived in Paris? What for us was a, a, a myth became, uh, we started to digest this and in such a way that uh, what, what I did and, uh, and, and also a nephew of mine who came a month after for the first time in my life I had all the hours of the day for myself, I could invest them in working and and using whatever means we had with uh, just India ink and uh, gouache and uh, cardboards, tempera. And we were able to uh, produce uh, work for a hotel without any particular theme, but what we were discovering and practicing as we went along. Um, we have some of the, the gouaches is coming up on, on a loop, but I think that um, you talk about this serial work, that, that you developed a, a serial kind of programmatic approach to art, which, I mean, at the time was very different from what was popular in the museums and at the galleries, no, which was a form of abstract expressionism or tachisme, no? What was, what was popular in Paris at the time? What was uh, reigning really strongly, it was a tachismo, informal paintings, uh, abstract, attention, one would find this in all uh, Parisian galleries. Uh, in one of the, uh, this was not in, enough. If there was uh, something different, uh, then they would reject it. It would be rejected a very, uh, very prejudicially in an exaggerated way. Uh, something uh, pre pre presenting and, a geometric form for a gallery was like a sin. You said that we studies that how to activate the peripheral vision as opposed to the focal vision. Maybe you can explain a little bit about that. Unfortunately, we don't have one of those slides up, but um, the black and white studies. Yes. 
Uh, based on an, an analysis that we would do among ourselves as a young artist wi within a society where we saw that uh, maybe four or five people could determine whether an artist would be valued or overvalued, uh, we felt that instead of uh, listening to art critics or the museum director, the collector, we would address from that, we would, we would see how with our tools and our India Inc. Uh, or, or try to create a, some, to some sort of relationship which was either optical or visual with any viewer who would uh, uh, watch our experiences. It's also this democratization of the art that the artist is is irrelevant in the sense of the artist's genius, that anyone, if you fi follow a process, um, could, could find a way of activating the surface of, the, of the, either the, the canvas or the paper. And uh, I think in some way you anticipated the ideas expressed by somebody like Saul LeWitt in his wall paintings in which he passes on specific instructions using um, simple variations of line drawings. Uh, and, and so maybe in terms of um, talking about your, the process, your idea of working with this serial programmatic approach, how, how you almost came, how you came to the idea of incorporating light, that it was almost an accident, um, that it was your way of solving certain formal problems. Maybe you can talk about when you first introduced um, light. First of all, the first uh, uh, effort with my uh, with my colleagues was to get off that pedestal that we wanted to be on as artists, and uh, we would say, well, why be an artist if we're integrating into a system that eliminates uh, something that is quite important, which is the people, the viewers, and uh, so we would say more than try to uh, make works of art, we wanted to gain ex experiences and provide experiences and, and move away a little bit from what we had been taught in the fine arts school, which was uh, that for e any artist to be uh, successful, he had to have a style, and that forced you to become a monothematic artist, uh, spend 10, 20, 30, 40 years drawing the same thing or painting the same thing but with certain variations. So our attitude was to experiment without a bias, without aspiring for recognition or immediate sales. Uh, light came not as a as a, a desire to do this, but the problems that I was uh, dealing with m my uh, medium, the multiplication of variation throughout the, especially the, the, the paintings in color, I was trying to see how I could visualize the entire potentiality of change variation that were present in that first uh, tempera. So that's why I was, I, I started doing small uh, uh, trials where colors could rotate and appear and disappear in a very small yeah, space. I try to bring up um, showing some of the pictures of the different influences. Oh, but, uh, so uh, this is part of the, the, the sequences and the serial uh, studies that you were mentioning um, and how it fed into your larger works. Maybe, uh, maybe you can describe this work, the Seconce Progressive. Yes, this was the first uh, wash, wash uh, medium that I used where I could uh, start from using a very simple system that would determine the location of the various forms on the 
on the canvas and it, it was uh, something that um, I studied and based on our visualization, we wanted to see how this experience could uh, would bring alive in the viewer a, a visual experience, a perif uh, peripheral vision as opposed to the focal vision. And uh, so this was an experiment f with the normal eye, and we used these uh, systems that allowed us to modify in order to stress cer certain effects or, l or look for variation of that instability effect. Okay, estos son algunos de los estudios used 14 pure colors. Maybe you can describe a little bit of the process with these. Yes, uh, one of the, expe uh, the experiences in, in black and white at that point, I thought, well, maybe I could use some color and work it under the same principles, I looked uh, for a range of about 14 colors and also with a very basic uh, system, we looked for sy systems that could be changing. And then after that, I went to the little light boxes. I wanted to show that potential. This is the light box, right? It's realmente extraordinary. Extraordinary? Well, it's the work of a genius, isn't it? For us, it was always uh, experiences, and and in from one experience, we would pass on to another, and uh, there would be we would take the possibilities that they offered by manipulating our materials and things that could move us a little forward. We moved back, we moved sideways, but most of all, it was maintaining that attitude of trial. Plexiglass squares in the light boxes, such as this one uh, from 1961. That's what brought you to the next phase, where where you take the plexiglass squares outside of the box and into the spectators uh, or the the viewers environment, um, such as the one on the right that that we're showing at the exhibition too. Well, no, es, eh, sí. sí, tenemos esta, pero. Y también tenemos la de, we also have the one ta, from, también tenemos uh, la de que, the, la que usted mostró uh, Paris Biennial in, in, in 1963. Um, but maybe this is a good moment to start talking about your interaction with Grave, with a group, which also the name uh, Group de Recherche d'Art Visuel has that idea of almost scientific research. Um, and of creating a process. H how did the actual group evolve, or how did you start the group in 1960, I guess? Or yes, well, for us, when we uh, arrived in Paris, we started to work together with uh, the habits that we had already formed in Buenos Aires, and then we tried to find young artists who had the same concerns as we did, and it was kind of difficult to find that through Victor Vasarelli, who uh, uh, also had relationship with some of them. We had the first in exchange, we uh, found uh, common interest, and we proposed a, a more permanent group, and that uh, became more formal once we uh, a, a, we got a, a small old garage, and then that we had a physical space, and that um, made the, the, the group, and we had our charter. Uh, and we started working mm -hmm. and, uh, jointly so at that had, space. Um, your first street action was when you handed out flyers on the steps of the 1961 Paris Biennale uh, with your manifesto, Enough Mystification. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that, the manifesto. 
Well, uh, our attitude of analysis and, and critique in, at the second biennial of youth biennial in Paris, we felt that the young artists of our own generation were subject to that academic uh, standard of uh, that uh, tachismo, uh, that uh, lyrical attraction type. And, uh, uh, and we looked at other concerns, and we were outside of the uh, Paris Biennial. The interesting thing is that we went to I hand out this manifesto at the biennial, and, and the biennial itself, uh, years later, they came to see an exhibition, a small exhibition that we had uh, put on in Paris. They were quite interested, and for the following biennial, they invited us to exhibit at the entrance of, in the foyer of the 1963 biennial. There are some... Uh, slides that they showed of that. These are <laughs> things that happen in life. But, uh, before that, actually, you had come to New York, no? Um, yes, that, in fact, the poster for the biennial, the, uh, we designed ourselves. And that's the uh, continual mobile that uh, we had to reduce the size to fit into um, the PAM Museum because it's so monumental. But it really is where you, you suspended these mirrors and, and, and the light reflecting really became an environment that, that uh, changed all the time. And, and that concept of instability, uh, you had quite a few exhibitions with that title. How does instability work into your uh, relationship with the viewer? What is the idea? It's a very important term for you, instability. Para usted ese término instabilidad parece ser muy importante, ¿no? Yes, it was important, and we that was the title of several of our exhibitions. It, it was called the Open Art Programmed Art for Us. It was instability, incorporating uh, sterile elements into the work. The instability that one could also find in our own environment where things uh, seem to be fixed, but these, but these were uh, artistic appreciations of how things happen in real life, even in the political work. We stress that, uh, that there was a certain instability, that that could be the foundation for future change. Cambio social. Also, and within the uh, medium of uh, plastic and, arts and, and appreciation. As, as you I was mentioning, the, these shows also traveled to New York. You were in New York, I think, in 62 and 63, and then again in 65 when uh, you did the labyrinth um, at, the, um, at the gallery of uh, the contemporaries. How, how was your work received in New York, or who, who did you come into contact? What was your feeling then? That first exhibition, <coughs> had something that was important for us at that time. Uh, they, 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 they said this was an exhibition that was directed to the environment to, uh, to meet with local artists, to create some sort of in interchange or exchange, that was one of the levels. The other was the commercial level that all galleries look for, and it worked. And uh, there was also a certain recognition of the institution. So, uh, so the people from the MoMA came to our little exhibit. They bought some of our works. All of that later on, uh, uh, at the time, there was the time of the Cold War and struggle in New York against Paris as an international art center. 
he disappeared because the fight was to eliminate Paris as an art center so that it would be New York. And in the same way, the North could have a dominion and a control in that sense, and in a very deliberate manner, they promoted North American artists, <laughs> and logically, with this type of work and trend, uh, North American artists were not the uh, protagonists. So it was very difficult for the following years, someone who came from Europe or from Paris could have uh, some type of uh, recognition in North America, and much less if from Europe or Paris, Latin American artists uh, would uh, come because Latin America was considered like uh, the backyard, which is what they say in the United States. So there was some kind of uh, oystracism for decades, uh, mostly, with uh, situations that were sometimes uh, absurd. <laughs> One time in Madrid, in the most uh, important uh, place, uh, there was an exhibition organized uh, in New York about uh, geometrics in art. I visited uh, the exhibition and I saw <coughs> that Practically, there were no European artists, nor Latin American ones, even though uh, in that same room, in that same exhibition, a few months before, I had seen a full exhibition of Spanish artists only, and there was no artwork from any of those Spanish artists, only maybe perhaps at the beginning of the exhibition, some uh, artwork of Picasso, Geometrics, uh, Miro. So I thought there was manipulation because every Latin American artist back in the 40s, uh, Mexican artists, Venezuelan artists, then Europeans, besides the Spanish, I'm talking about Italians from Yugoslavia, Germans, there was absolutely nothing, nothing from our group, absolutely nothing. So this is an example in the way how they manipulated and transformed uh, and, and do you think uh, that maybe history. why also the responsive eye was so misunderstood in terms of the kinetic art that they um, that there was an inclusion of American artists who really had little to do with what you were doing in Europe? Where I didn't understand. The ideas of North American were very but, different but from you yours. Also talk about having Pero usted with, habló uh, también de haber uh, se reunido Donald con Dan Slavin o Donald John cuando usted estuvo en sí, Nueva York. Yes, yes, in the small exhibition, the first one that we had. Yes, in that sense, yes, we did. Yes. How did you pronounce it? Donald Judd. Judd. Donald Judd. Donald Judd. Donald Judd, yes, he was very nice. He was an art critic. And he was just starting his uh, with his sculptures, which is very different, and he became very famous. And precisely, he was the one who told us that starting from now, Paris will die up because there is a general agreement in New York that New York has to be the international art center uh, among gallery owners, uh, museum directors, collectionists in New York who had all agreed not to buy any more art in Europe and buy artwork from North American artists with that aim. We also received a visit from a very young man, Ten Flavin. Flavin. Yes, Flan. One day he came to the gallery and he had a fluorescent uh, light. And this is a type of art that I 
do. And he developed it at the beginning in a monothematic way, but little by little it became more and more important, mostly with the uh, fluorescent uh, and color and light. Going back to Paris, Bolindo your day on the street where you, you actually brought the um, works of art onto the streets of Paris. Uh, could be considered a, a type of institutional criticism or relational aesthetics. And in your manifesto, you, you spoke <laughs> about demystifying art and, and the question, questionnaires that you handed out at the time also spoke about uh, the public's perception of art museum critics and artists. Um, maybe you can tell some of the <clears throat> details about that day on the streets of Paris. We, we have the map will be coming around at one point and, and some photographs of the events, but if you could tell more details about what exactly went on that day in Paris. Well, from the very beginning, we started doubting the, these statements uh, making uh, believe that uh, the viewers were ignorant and that they were not able to appreciate the art. So in our first exhibition in 1962, we handed out a questionnaire and we had such a high response that we had to reprint the questionnaire because we realized that people, when they have the opportunity, they can express uh, uh, what they are seeing, share their opinions, comparisons, and that all they need is just a little stimulus or maybe have the opportunity of doing it. And within that same line, we said to ourselves, what would happen if Paris, which is a city with its own rhythm, its own uh, habits, our idea was to disrupt in some way, maybe in some areas in Paris, that rhythm. At the beginning, it was simply just by handing out a gift at the entrance of the underground, and people could think maybe it was some advertisement, but it wasn't really commercial advertisement, and it was not a provocation, so to say. It was just a small invitation, just uh, announcing that we would be visiting different areas, which we did uh, with the police who would come after us every time, but we were able to conduct this experience all day long, and, and from morning how, how to night. How did the public receive it? Because there were many, these are just a few of the elements of the um, of the day, because you, you told me once that, that there was another one where one person was holding a balloon at one end of the street, and you gave a needle ah, to the sí, other... No, eran diferentes, diferentes experiencias, diferentes, lo que está hablando Estrellita es en una cuadra <coughs> había uno de nosotros que repartía unas alfileres grandes que la gente podía tomar o no tomar y en, la, en, el, en el lugar opuesto había otro de nosotros que repartía globos inflados de colores. De manera que en un momento, so that at some point, personas, both people would meet and they would just aguja, find each globo, other and the one who had the balloon had the balloon and they didn't know there was someone else there with a needle. And then they could act or do whatever they wished depending on their own personalities. The one with the needle could see the balloon and maybe say to themselves, when I can blow up the balloon with the needle, or if I had the balloon, I could protect it because it was a gift that I had received, and so on and so forth. It was a very simple proposition um, among people so that they could use these elements which were not really artistic, but rather just to give them the opportunity of having a different behavior in their everyday life. And I, I think that idea, you know, brings us to the aesthetic of play because you also <coughs> incorporated um, play elements in your, your work as in the, the Venice Biennale where you, I love this photograph of the, uh, the bishop with the, the, the alter, al site altering glasses, but always this idea of reconsidering yourself within a social space. <coughs> and, and that story of the balloons is, it's almost dangerous um, 
the, the, the concept that you could be attacked by a needle, but also your play sometimes can be very aggressive. What, what, what was your thought about including play mm -hmm. elements in a museum, which at the time was unique, I mean, or in an institutional setting? La, la, la. Lugar institucional. Las alfileres estaban desinfectadas. The needles were <laughs> disinfected. Sure. De seguro. And the balloons, all they had no was air. There were no sí. dangerous <laughs> gases. <laughs> that was going to be my next... Uh, we would just go places, uh, uh, the times, whenever we had uh, a situation that would allow us to share our experiences. At the beginning, the first uh, uh, exhibition was in our own uh, shop, in our own, where it was limited. But then, little by little, we found different spaces where we could uh, uh, present. And then uh, the Biennial in Paris allowed us to use that big space. And in other cases, it was within that same uh, place. Uh, it could be a Biennial, it could be a museum, a big institutional exhibition. It was just to include those elements, uh, basically, that would be opposite to the general functioning, where you're not allowed to touch anything in a museum. It's dangerous. You can't even come close to the artwork. Sometimes they put uh, barriers. And our idea was for people to at least show that people could engage and, in fact, just uh, also provide something uh, to the uh, and, and I think it, it really is ideas that we that, presented. Uh, Can I get the meeting? exhibition now, the, the people are interacting with the works, but there is this tendency not to touch. I mean, and, and you wrote your, your, your text on it is forbidden not to participate. And, and th that brings us a little bit to your writing. You've been a prolific writer. Um, and could you speak a little bit more about the purpose of your writing in the context of your plastic work? And how would you situate something like uh, Guerrilla Cultural that you wrote in 68? Um, is it a manifesto? Is it a reflection on your experiences? How do you see those texts in that particular one? Well, I've uh, written uh, reacting to very specific situations. I never just write uh, just for the sake of writing, except for a poem once in a while with very precise uh, thoughts, whether it's a friend, a, a, a painter, to a city, a success, uh, an event. But all those small texts are situated in a time and space uh, regarding the uh, events. And sometimes in the artistic uh, world in Paris, whether before 68, when we had the big uh, revolution of the uh, French uh, people, it was like an invitation that within the artistic uh, environment, we could also um, put uh, functions in spaces that were taken by very small groups. And in that text, the cultural guide, I would just do like an analysis of general situation, offering different proposals of uh, awakening or activating the uh, artistic uh, world. In terms of Many of those texts were uh, created together with the uh, visual arts experience group. And some of them were just uh, and, uh, done actually, by myself. Oops, sorry. And, and this uh, was, I think, your involvement with the um, May 68 uh, manifestations, no? The Atelier Populaire. And this is also, I think, the your engagement with some of the artists in Argentina, no? With uh, Tucumán Arde that you covered. Or you were in dialogue with the, um, the magazine Robo. Because you've always had a very uh, committed... I, I know with your work with La Denuncia and and the uh, La Tortura that you did is uh, in reaction to the dictatorships. You've been very active in terms of that too. You haven't sort of been a 
Certainly, you, you've been a very committed artist, and 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 if you had any uh, bit of um, advice for a younger generation of artists, what would what would it be? No, no. no. Older generation of artists. Oh, no, older no, generation no. of artists. No, I can't <laughs> give any advice. I believe that uh, there's so many things that haven't been done within visual arts, and most surely behaviors, attitudes that happened in the past are still there. And in the future, most surely, there are many other things that need to be discovered invented, realized, whether individually, whether by a group, whether with the ideas of changing the uh, functioning of the, uh, the way that we value contemporary creation where money rules. Uh, young people in their head can have germs of things that they will suggest and that will come up. So it's very difficult to criticize or to give any advice to a young artist. It's very difficult because anything can happen within uh, the legacy that we leave for a new generation of artists that we can't see, but that they will be able to continue, move forward, and uh, do different things. And young people maybe can get together and reflect uh, as a whole but that would be their responsibility, which I cannot really give any advice. Only just say not to let anyone dominate, not to be submissive, and not to just uh, look for recognition uh, no matter what, or just to sell your artwork. It's normal, and it would be normal for a young artist to make a living out of their uh, art, but when this can... Uh, affect oh, the creation, know, it is but, um, dangerous. But one more question, and in terms of institutions, <laughs> museums, any advice to them and fetishizing art? Do you believe in... Okay. Institutions that have uh, the resources, I believe they could uh, apply them in, the, in searching a complement to value the uh, current art. See how people receive it. Many times, exhibitions uh, are valued according to how many people came to visit. But in many times, people just walk in and out from exhibitions. And they could just be transformed by these small devices or by the uh, tickets that people buy. It's just numbers. 20,000 visitors. 100, uh, amazing, but those visitors, did they see, did they receive, did they have any reaction uh, when they went all through those exhibitions? That is something that we will never know. So the, usually uh, they are looking for figures, for numbers. So there's an artificial mechanism being created. Uh, an art, uh, quote unquote, that uh, if it's two million dollars, it has to be amazing. Not because of its quality, but just because someone paid two million dollars. So the opinion of someone who got two million dollars out of their pocket, uh, they're giving value to a piece of art. But what of those people who cannot pay? Uh, at the end, they're silenced. An art <laughs> and open it to question. <laughs> and uh, and uh, another thing that you said about your own exhibition when you were asked uh, what you would what your goal would be for this exhibition was if people well I'll let you say the optimismo no que si entran con un poquito su su deseo personal para mí es suficientemente satisfactorio and throughout all these decades of work, uh, creating an exhibition such as this uh, in PAM, under the uh, curator Estrellita, for me, it's an 
big satisfaction if people who come and visit the exhibition with a certain degree of optimism after walking through it, and if, when they leave, the optimism has been a little higher. In a small degree, for me, that would justify all my artwork, that it wasn't an effort or a sacrifice. It was a joyful and interesting uh, piece of art. But if people in this exhibition in PAM experience a little more optimism, for them to feel more reassured in themselves, for me, that would be uh, so enough. So optimistic... Perfecto. <laughs> With that optimistic note, should we open it to questions and answer? <laughs> Are there any questions? Buenas tardes, maestro. Buenas tardes. Yo quisiera, eh, usted dice que no, I would like no, no le gusta dar consejos. To, uh, you said that no you don't perdemos. like to give uh, Pero quizás advice, una but maybe you could share an anecdote of some magical moment. Visible, en aquella época, at that en ese garage, time, at, in that garage, when, they decide, when you decided to make a more formal mejor, group, uh, uh, maybe revelarnos. you could reveal to us, and, uh, to us and uh, new artists who are now uh, meeting in their garages, no give us uh, some inspiration, maybe not advice, but some inspirational guide. I love it. I loved it when you were talking about that time at, in the garage. I, I, I think this is something that must have been full of anecdotes when you say that that process where you have to leave the youth by themselves so that they will discover something. And all of you in that garage creating all of this work, I was wondering whether you had an anecdote that you would like to share with us. Well, uh, that physical space, well, it was a very small garage, maybe like at this, uh, this stage. There was only one car that would could fit in there. It was full of uh, oil. We had to clean it. We had to make a door. We had to paint the walls. Uh, we had to put up light fixtures, but the important thing was the joint effort because at that time it was not just cleaning the floor, but it was that and uh, talking about things that we could do among ourselves. It, it was also uh, all the other problems, the uh, finances, which was small, um, it was a small amount, but for us it was a big deal to be able to buy the paint, to paint the walls. It, it was the sharing experience. We shared a lot. We shared expectations, what we had accomplished, what was possible. In, in that small garage, we would invite people to come and, and uh, present to us. So little by little, this, was, this served us well. There is a photograph somewhere of us, some of us, uh, Talking, Victor Vasarelli visited this place during our, our openings, and uh, along with Rene and other artists. And logically, there are a lot of anecdotes, but uh, like for instance, I cannot tell you about the day my nephew f uh, argued with me. Uh, greetings, we are from Ecuador. I would like to ask, I, I would like to ask the maestro, what do you feel when you are creating? And at the end, what sensation that you have that you have completed a work? Okay. Um, I want to ask the maestro, what do you feel when you are creating that process of creation and at the end of once you have completed the work? Uh, 
what happened is that there, there is really no beginning, there is no end. For me, it was like uh, small stages when there is a beginning. It's a, it's a, it's a process that's tied to other processes. And when you come to that end, uh, from that end, there is a new beginning that starts. And sure, logically, uh, the result is one is discovering and seeing that your uh, work is materialized in, in, in an object. It is, of course, quite satisfactory. E and every time you make a drawing, there is another drawing that comes up, and this continues and continues, right? Yes, because as I was saying, it's an attitude of experimentation, continual experimentation within my own par parameters, logically. And the fact that uh, you are aware of everything that surrounds you and and it can come through your hand and be little uh, sketches. And throughout that evolution, I myself will feel alive. I feel active. I, I feel that I have uh, 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 an objective. That is from the Paris Biennial in 1963. Hi. Um uh, I'd like to ask you about the um, relationship of uh, politics and art, artists today. I mean, uh, being from Latin America, I'd like to understand how uh, artists are dealing with that today in your view. I believe that that uh, the solutions will be appearing um, along the lines that they are uh, being active to the extent that solutions uh, don't become impositions. Because uh, once I was visiting an, uh, an exhibit in Paris and they said, this group of work are from political artists. And for instance, I saw a photograph there was a big poster, almost as large as the photograph, that explained what the person in the photograph, that the person in the photograph was married. It was the brother-in-law of someone who had been killed for political reasons. So in order to understand the image that was being presented, I was looking at someone who was resting against a wall. Uh, I was trying to look at the darks and lights or imagine something, but it would never have occurred to me that the person in that uh, photograph was the brother-in-law of someone who had been killed for political reasons. So. It, you have you'll have that information and that anecdote which might be even uh, stronger than the visual presence that of what you are looking at and to me that uh, robs the work of its nature I don't know if it can be called a message or information or a situation a political situation in other cases in, uh, where I've had occasion to see uh, that sometimes, for instance, during the, the 70s where there was a lot of uh, uprising, uh, colleagues of, uh, of mine would talk about elitist art. We would, at one time we were at a festival and uh, we saw we, we saw the ballet of Pina Bush, uh, an extraordinary dancer. I said, there is no political message there. There is no message of denunciation of anything. But the beauty of the, spe of the show itself, of the event, gave rise not to a political response, but to a state that went beyond whatever message uh, 
a painting could uh, transmit, such as the, the one in the photograph that uh, of the person that was resting against the wall. Uh, the, what what it gave rise to was something inside of me. The, the other, the dance was visual, it was tempor temporary, and everything was in, in, in there, that type of uh, beauty. Could be maybe even more political than just an image making a denunciation. Here is the photograph of the new uh, trend. This was another group. Yes, this was the the uh, group workshop with artists from other countries. Came from Holland, uh, Spain, Germany, Yugoslavia, it Italy. These were meetings that we held to to give form to what we were called, calling new trends or what was being called a new trend. Hello, Maestro. I am from Venezuela. I had an opportunity to be at your exhibit at the PAM Museum. I went and you signed uh, my catalog also. I left there very pleased and much more joyful. My question is optimism. Has this something that has always been present in your life? Has it been a help, uh, those principles of experience in Paris throughout all these years? <laughs> Whether I've always been happy? <laughs> Yes, uh, from the time I was a youngster. Yes. Uh, with no particular hatred. When I was young, uh, across from the house where my family and I lived, there was a great big wall. And being being that I was small, I felt the, the wall was so much larger. And beyond that, there was what we call the English club. The, the English club was the leaders of the, the tr railroad who were the owners of this. And beyond that, there were uh, bars so that the tennis balls would not go across the wall. There were other people who were not my mother, nor my father, nor my, nor my uncle. They were not our people. They were in there, and I was on the other side of that wall. But even though I did not have a tennis ball and the white garb, it did not go to cocktails, we were always happy because with what we had, uh, we found that what we had was enough. Uh, we found things to play with, we invented games, those things were enough, uh, we did not uh, lack for anything else, so I was always happy. Oh, uh, there was something else I wanted to say, but it's slipping my mind. Maestro, a question. There's a question over here. Carmen Rey Diego, I am from Madrid, Spain. Would you please speak? Carmen Rey Diego, I am from Madrid, Spain. I feel so privileged to be here listening to you. Maestro, don't call me maestro. No. Uh, uh, one day, uh, someone asked me yesterday, how should I call you at, at, at this uh, meet? At, this conversation, should you call me maestro, friend, painter, et cetera, et cetera? How should we address you? I said nothing of that. I said, just call me genius directly. I feel so privileged being here with the great uh, genius and with Estrellita. A question that occurs to me throughout your conversation, I believe that you have transmitted the fact that the artist is responsible for the spiritual environment of the period. How do you feel 
uh, about the artist that you were and, well, as the artist that you are with regard to past and present, do you feel equally responsible? Responsible with to myself, to my environment, with history, with uh, to history uh, of the time that you have lived in the when you talked to us of the past, when you talked about our Argentina, Paris, that idealism that you had uh, during at that time. Do you still view yourself as an idealist? Idealist? Yes. A, a pessimist, to be a pessimist would be a sad thing. If I were a pessimist, instead of drinking water, I would be demanding whiskey to drown my sorrows. Well, we all drink our whiskey at times. But do you feel just as comfortable uh, uh, now as you felt back then or back then as you do now? Do you feel equally uh, well in as an artist in, in no, not as an artist, as a genius. No, as an experimenter. Uh, yes, I do feel. Well, what is, is. The, there are absurdities, and injustice, injustice still remains, there are atrocities, uh, the planet seems to be going down, but I'm not going to get under my bed waiting for the end of the world. Uh, one uh, tries to have faith in something. It's better to have faith that things will change, that things can change, even though it might seem uh, the change might seem difficult because sometimes things worsen. But to me, it is vital to be able to live. And in order to live, you have to hold on to something. I hold on to my work, my ideas, and w without any type of uh, uh, too much uh, pretensions, because it is enough. If I can get a paper and a pencil and do a little sketch, uh, draw, uh, draw a cloud that is floating away and emerging and uh, hiding. It's, uh, it's like nourishment that one uh, looks for as if you were a, a small bird or, and these things add up and they create, uh, the, the sum of all of these small things uh, become uh, an, exhi an exhibit like we have at PAM where other people can also uh, approach and nourish themselves along with me, with my proposition. Good morning, uh, Mr. Uh, Genius. Uh, at the artistic level, do you have anything pending that you have not yet done? At, at, at an artistic le level, do you have anything pending at the artistic level? Yes. Uh, the question is, it, uh, do you have anything that yet pending? Oh, there are many. Uh, for instance, many, many, many things that maybe are among what I have already done, and it has a potential of de de developing further or to be presented in another way, uh, uh, topics that just were left on the drawing board. But, but what is pending is, it's not that it's confusing, but uh, it's not yet well defined, uh, awaiting uh, occasions and opportunities. As I said before, my work at the beginning was limited to a room, a hotel room. Now, uh, here in Miami, it's limited by the walls of the museum. Uh, there, there is a qualitative change of form and content uh, with many years of work. 
According to the circumstances, the requests that these pending matters will continue to take form and become uh, something concrete. Maybe I, I'll be able to develop them in a year or two, 10 years, 15 years. It might take me 25 years to, in, in the hopes of uh, resolving it. Uh, it. You might, I would say 25 years is a reasonable number. No? Um, I'm curious if you believe that the current art world, including emerging artists, if it's fairly represented by Spanish-speaking countries, if there's a balance, and if you think the current political shift could change that one way or the other. <coughs> yes, I expect uh, it to change. And uh, uh, the proof for Latin American uh, Hispanics here, for example, in the United States, a proof of it, an example could be work conducted by the museum in Houston, the work that Estrellita conducts with Latin American artists, and the results of this exhibition at PAM. And logically, I believe that in every place, everywhere, every continent has its creators and its own system of functioning, of realization. Problem is that it seems that if you don't have any recognition from the United States, it's not really 100% valid. The situation here in North America, after the war between New York and Paris, which New York won, there could be some con condescendence and uh, push. The uh, spirit of Latin American artists could vary the valorization systems. And at some point, the uh, history of uh, modern contemporary art can change and take into consideration work uh, developed in Latin America that could contribute to the current uh, art world that many times has been ignored. But they existed, and it does have uh, their influence in history when it's written in a different way. That's what I've been told by the powers of bees. So thank you. Gracias.